Justin Rasmussen. Hell yes, okay, cool. We love tracking you. Good. So actually, it's being predicted, but it's also available to deliver to the organization. Not necessarily a 40 work week, but an understanding of the. Please uh, give him another round of applause. He's a bit nervous, he's not used to this attention. So just make him feel Australian sarcasm. Come on. Um, please give him another round of applause. Steen Rasmussen. Thank you. So it is kind of fun, <coughs> me speaking here today, because we were actually sitting looking at the program, and we found out it was now it was 15 years. And I started looking back and saying, OK, I haven't spoken at a Web Analytics Wednesday in eight years. So I've only hosted and brought other people on stage, and I feel very loud, Frederick. OK, good. Uh, so I thought, why not do this presentation? I've been traveling around uh, measure camps in Europe and doing this presentation, and I've basically done it a lot of places, but never in Denmark. So I thought, why the hell not share it with you? It's 25 minutes, so it should be fairly accessible. And actually, we're going to start out in 97. AD. So that's basically 2,000 years ago, almost. Now, 2,000 years ago, there was a, a Chinese man called Gan Ying that traveled from China. And he traveled all the way from China until he hit the edge of the Mediterranean, probably somewhere around, yeah, the Mediterranean uh, on this side. And he had traveled almost two years to get there. And when he got there, he was like, he talked to some sailors saying, yeah, he's going, I'm going to Rome. And they were like, yeah, it's going to take you between three months and three years to get to Rome from here by his boat. And he was like, oh, so he turned around and went back to China. And this was 100 years after Christ. And we'll get back to why this is an important part of the decision economy or inspiration later, but think about this poor Chinaman uh, having traveled two years and then turning back. <sighs> because the, when it comes to the decision economy, and one of the things that we've been taught in analytics forever, is basically this thing that if you gather all the data, you can make all the decisions. That is kind of the core mantra of analytics. If we track if we track stuff, then we can make decisions, and that's the, the key thing. And if we ask the customers, the one that are client side, uh, what will a customer say when I say, hey, customer, what should I track? Everything. Right? That's kind of the easy thing. If they track everything, they're not going to miss out on anything. So, so that's going to be fine. And so then they have everything, and they can make all the decisions in the world. And that's good, but it's also part of the problem. But... But that is what we've been taught, and that is the analytics project we've processed, we've learned, gather the data, make decisions. And I think what I will argue today is that we need to change that approach. There's the, the entire privacy issue is impacting the way if we can do this. There are so many things that are changing in the environment of, of we're working that we need to reconsider our approach to analytics. And the first thing is this. So how many people know this gentleman, and how many people know this lady? And how many people know this lady because they saw my presentation earlier that I introduced him? Yeah, okay, cool. So the interesting thing here is Avinash has, for a lot of people, he is the godfather of web analytics. So he wrote three, four books on web analytics. He is the big guru when it comes to web analytics. If you study web analytics, you will come across him, you will meet him, you will know who he is. Um, Cassie, not so much, right? So Cassie is more of a blank face, but the interesting thing is, Avinash used to work for Google, he was their chief evangel uh, analytics evangelist. And he has, I think, 200,000 followers on LinkedIn, which is pretty decent for an uh, analytics evangelist, right? Now, Cassie, just stop, but she used to be the chief decision scientist for Google. 
and she has 500,000 followers on LinkedIn. And the interesting thing is, is this is the shift that we're facing now in relation to analytics. This is the perception of changing analytics from an analytics tool to a decision tool. And so, so this is the mind shift, shift that we will be focusing on today. And I think for, for all of you, if you don't know Cassie, this is a good time to check her out, follow her on LinkedIn. She is, a, she is the one talking about decisions and AI, and she has massive courses for free in relation to this space that is the next frontier that we all will have to dive into. But first we need to have this decision mindset. Because the decision playing field is basically the, the, the place we are and the, the thing that we're working with, right? Because why does anybody have analytics? Why have people implemented analytics? <sighs> they have to. Well, <laughs> it's a sad answer. Because they want to make better decisions. They want to have data so they can make decisions, right? So in reality, analytics is a part of this decision economy, but this decision economy is in the US alone $500 billion. That is the investment yearly on decision making, or the, the, the processes, the money spent on decision making. So pushing that forward, saying what is it, what is the, um, um, Fleming talked about the, 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 uh, the, uh, the CDP promise. So the analytics promise that we give people is saying, yeah, if you install analytics, we can give you descriptive. We can tell you what happened. We can tell you why it happened. We can tell you what will happen. And we can even tell you why, what, where, how we can make things happen. Now, the problem in this is, of course, that most of us as companies are mainly still meddling in the first one, right? So if you look at the majority of time you're spending in analytics, that is being done making descriptive analytics. We're looking back, we have the monthly report where we discussed what happened last month, and then we book a meeting next month where we discuss what happened last month. So we're still meddling in historical data, and, and that's not really fulfilling the promise. The vision is also saying we, when, when you get analytics, you will be able to, to go in and do automation and improve your decision quality and better Im motivate your employees and get fewer errors. Second promise of analytics. Right? So, so this is what the people who invested in a major Google setup, a snowplow, an amplitude, even an Adobe solution, this is what they were promised. And... They were also promised that data is the new oil. That we can store this and it has ma magical value Then we will be able to carry on forever and forever. And I think that the, the, the challenge of that is that data, when we look at it, especially consumer data, reminds much more of a popsicle, an ice cream, than it does of oil because it has momentary value when you have it, but you need to act on it fast because otherwise it will become worthless. So the example is saying, cool, Robert, my man, I have all of Amazon's data from 2008. How much will you give me for it? Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> It's worthless. There is no oil value in data because d data is tied to a context, right? Data is situational. It reflects, it exists as part of a universe. And, and, and it's kind of the, one of the lies of analytics that we've been taught is saying analytics is science. Well, the problem is it's not science because it's closer to psychology because it's about people and people change their opinion all the time. Right? So that is why fashion change, that is why things change over time, because it's people. So we need to grab that popsicle and eat it while it's cold, because otherwise it will just run down our hand and make it messy. It will be a waste of data. So having the focus, we gather data to make decisions. <laughs> 